was over at Ancient Ways. And uh, there are so many things that, you know, the chemicals that, you know, of course, I take drugs myself, you know. Yeah. And I've been doing that for quite a number of years because of my various conditions. But uh, yeah, learning about herbal remedies and and a different approach to uh, treatment. You know, it's, why why are people knocking this down? Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. After all, food was the first medicine oh. because people would eat plants, or they would pour their food into a tea and drink it, or they would uh, make it into a pulp and apply it to the skin. Yeah, right. Our traffic. Yeah, yeah. You can uh, you can take, uh, for instance, uh, uh, thin uh, uh, willow bark. Uh, yeah, shave it off the branches or twigs, put it into alcohol such as uh, like vodka because just plain vodka because it has no, no flavor in itself. And then you let that sit for at least a month. And then usability. And if it needs to sit longer, it needs to sit longer. You know, it does what it does in its own time. And then you strain it, and you have what's called a willow bark tincture, and you use right, some yes, uh, drops at a time to treat whatever. You know. and you're refreshed and ready yeah. to engage. Yeah. Get up and sit down. <laughs> My tape back, my into the second segment here. Um, and what I want to do in, talk, in this uh, second segment is talk about the fourth and fifth section of the book, Strategies and Tactics. But I really want to make the most important aspect of the book, which is how do we get our energy back to do battle? And I think is that there are a lot of books out there, a lot of articles talking about the problems, which sort of exposing some great articles, like right? you know, exposing the lack of social justice. So I mentioned to get up, stand up, like we can talk about a few more here, maybe some of you know others. But what I felt was this real, the gap, the void, was like, how do we get this energy back to do battle? What happens in traditional activism is you get people, the majority of people, to understand there's a serious problem here. It really wasn't the case. Through earlier that there's is that Americans that post and they have certain policies activism. That's what I wanted to do. So we're going to be talking about all that here. So when I start to research and research the book, and one of the things that I wanted to do um, was got to get back to one of my real old loves, which was history, especially American history, with the idea of taking a look at democratic movements. Um, and I want to Research that I would somehow kind of get a sense of like what was the, the psyche of people? You know, how did it, what, 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 that they had 
about democratic movements, at least for me, it doesn't take very long before you run into the name of Lawrence Goodwin, okay? No relation to Doris Goodwin, very different kind of historian. Um, he actually started out as a journalist, and he became pretty well known among historians as a historian of democratic movements um, around the world. for his work on the populist movement in America, the great farmers' revolt, the agrarian revolt in the 1880s, 1890s, which was, like, according to Goodman, I agree, the, the greatest democratic movement in, in American history, in a lot of ways, economically. And um, we're going to talk about the strategies of the populist movement, but for now, I want to just talk a little bit about something else, just about what he talked about early in one of his books, his famous book, is something called the, Popul the, the Populist Moment, is what it's called. And he talks about, there, are, there for him, when he, when he talked about what were the psychological and cultural building blocks for democratic movements, that he thought that there were two important areas. And these, for me, became important organizing principles of Get Up Stand Up, because that he referred to was one, individual self-respect, and two, was collective self-confidence. And by individual self-respect, what he meant was that people did not view themselves as inferior, that even in that great, in that popular Themselves, view themselves the way he calls it a subject to be a subject of power. They didn't accept their bequeathed role in the social hierarchy, is his phrase. And so they didn't have this sense of inferiority. They, the other aspect which they were to get was this collective self confidence, which was really simply this belief that you could actually win if you start a movement. And those have been really lost for me in America, that individual self-respect, that a few other areas that I think were also important building blocks for democratic movements. And all of these areas, all of these variables, I think are highly, they're not quantitative. You can't really put numbers on. And so, like my mind, is they tend to not look at the important variables of human life that you can't put numbers on because you can't do dissertations and you can't get publication. Life that you, besides the respect of collective self-confidence, there's no democratic movement in the history of the world that hasn't, hasn't gotten off the ground because if it, 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 did, if it did not have courage, courage is really important. Determination is usually important. Sorry, usually important. It's always about, almost all of democratic movements are always about organized people against organized money. I mean, that's a lot <laughs> of what they're always about. non quantitative you can't put numbers on, is this idea of anti-authoritarianism. Hugely by democratic movements. To define authoritarianism, Questioning obedience to authority. That's what authoritarian is. So if you're on top and you're authoritarian, you expect everybody to unquestionably obey. And if parties, you just question whether you take them all seriously or not. I mean, you you say like, well, does this authority know what they're talking about, or do they lie? Do they actually <laughs> care about people who are taken seriously? and you're an anti-authoritarian, you challenge that authority, you resist that authority. This, for me, is essential to democracy. And if you've got, you're not having, you know, an educational system and a whole society which creates, which sanctions and validates that as being okay, you pathology. <laughs> That's vital to democracy for more than one reason. What is vital intellectually? You, you know, you can't have real democracy without that healthy anti-authoritarianism, where, where people are challenging and questioning. Is 
going to talk give an example about from American history in a minute. But there's a certain energy that comes from anti-authoritarianism that helps movements get off the ground. And also, too, it also lends itself to In a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, when you see somebody else you know in your community who is challenging illegitimate authority, and you support them in the flesh, that's how you really build those strong bonds. And you need them because, I mean, when you have a democratic movement, there's somebody at the top, the, some elite, who's not going to want to give away. So you better have that solidarity. And so all of those things are real important. If you take a look, for me, in American history, there has really been a kind of decline in American society in terms of anti-authoritarianism, the decline. You can see it really most clearly is at the formation of this country, how anti-authoritarian our country was. Um, that was that. Um, Tom Perry in American history, and he. Unlike the, found, the elite founding fathers, and most of them were elitists. I mean, George Washington was the richest man in America in land dealing. Jefferson had slaves. Even the guys in New England were kind of Brahmin, you know, attorney elitist in their government. They've got the Adams, John Adams. But very different. To America, comes over to Philadelphia in 1774, and he is intoxicated by American anti authoritarianism. I mean, George Washington, I should, you know, people don't, in history, post the without action, without all that sort of stuff. From England, and he says, the whole of British authority is illegitimate here for us. He said, it's not just Parliament. You know, the heck, British company. We need to work among told by sister or common sense, the pamphlet that he puts out in January 1776. He does it anyways. And he turns mm -hmm. out he's much more in touch with the anti-authority of the American than a lot of the founding fathers really were. It turns out, you know, not too long a period of time, out of a free colonial population, as that's the equivalent of over 50 million people today. And it, it really sparks this American revolution. Six months of independence, these real share here for this thing. They realize that the people are ready to roll here. And you know, one of the things that even his enemies at the time, and a lot of those founding fathers personally did not like Paine, and they politically, he was way too democratic for, for them. Guys like John Adams and a lot of their others, but they all admitted that you know he was the most important democratic. By the way, in America, he went back to Europe and wrote the rights of man, trying to have democratic revolutions everywhere. There's a whole long story of what, how, what sadly America paid him back for that, but that we, that's a whole other story. But you know, the energy, I think, for me, what I wanted to talk about in, in that fourth section of Get Up Stand Up is how do we get back that energy of individual self respect, collective self confidence, solidarity, courage, determination, and this anti authoritarianism. Generation psychology, right? Because I think it's really an important notion that's not known so much here in America. It is known much more in places like Central America, South America, um, Africa. And we'll talk a little bit in a second. Why? Um, and first, I want to talk a little bit about how it was that discussed. We know, we know about liberation theology, all right, which really is basically a kind of movement of many embarrassed Jesuits and Franciscans in a lot of 
what a mainstream church policy in those areas is maintaining the status quo. It's just keeping people in power. And, and, and the status quo is one of supreme injustice economically, socially. And for them, you know, they're embarrassed. They're part of that system. And so they want to create this liberation psychology that helps people actually get more justice in their life. And so I have been in the psychology profession how we have become increasingly, as a profession, just helping people adapt and adjust, adapt and adjust to everything, whether it was through with drugs or with psychotherapy. Unjustice, unjustice. And so, well, they have liberation theology. We need liberation psychology, you know. And as soon as I said the term, I said, this is too good an idea. Somebody else has thought of it before me. So I did some research, and yep, they, it had America. Social psychology. It's, people are more familiar with that, and the person who probably should be given the most credit for making that term popular is a guy named Martin Barrow. And he was a Jesuit, a Jesuit priest in uh, El Salvador. And he, I should say that, he, sadly, I mean, he, in 1989, he was assassinated by a, a U.S. trained death squad. Things of, things of, let me talk about it here as well. It's the idea that people talk about that is that people can get to a point where they're so beaten down, so subjugated, so oppressed, that they move into states of kind of fatalism and defeatism. Where they see military juntas, where you have people like Pinochet or you know or Idi Amin or Gaddafi, it's very obvious you've got these tyrants, you know, and that people have been ter terrorized, you know, have been oppressed for so long that what internalized you can't. The, what you can't do because of external, what you do, and so you move into a kind of defeatism and helplessness. Bob Marley sang about this. Bob Marley, all of this was basically mental. But he called it, and so he sang about emancipate yourself from mental slavery. There's been, you know, the, the title of the book Get Up Stand Up is from a Bob Marley song because he for that title. So there's a lot of people, if you get Bob Marley, you get what I'm talking about. It's like, how do, you, how do you talk about the truths of oppression, but in such a way, like he did, that would uplift people as opposed to shut, up, shut them down? So, this core type, in some ways, it's an abusive relationship with a spouse or a parent or whoever, is that you have to help them get out of denial, okay? But you can't preach them, shame them, you can't do those kinds of things, okay? Canada, Canada is all about something. We all will. There will be some point in all of our lives where we are either major league or minor league being abused, being treated disrespectfully, whether it's a boss or whoever in, in your life, and that sometimes literally people literally sometimes need a sense of humor. They need um, we need some more we need some more free to um, Some theology is about how used to be used to be believe, believe, believe of all who have. 
United that that we've that that how we get divided and how we can kind of form some solidarity in this in this segment here. Um, one of the things is for us to sort of accept the reality is that powers to be are always going to try to divide us. That's what if you were at the top of the heap of a hierarchy, any hierarchy, and you were few in numbers and you were large in money, that's what you're going to do. So historically around the world, in America, we have been, they have attempted to divide us racially, certainly, on religious grounds, ethnically, immigrant, non-immigrant, all of that. Lately, a lot of ice, a lot of big wrinkle, especially it's going on by and I mean, which way to sort of divide and conquer, all right? And so it's important, one thing, it's important for us to kind of call this out and to here in this here in this More is how we divide ourselves, and and also if we understand how we divide ourselves, more empowering is is what we can do to not let that happen. All right. So that's one area that I talk about in Get Up Stand Up is the 